name is Professor Paul Bowman. I am Professor of Cultural Studies at Cardiff University in the United Kingdom and I am honoured to be able to present to you at this conference organised by the Henan Provincial Research Centre for Shaolin Kung Fu Translation. Um, I have researched different aspects of uh, martial arts for quite a few years now. I began writing about the impact of Bruce Lee on Western and global popular culture and I've written a range of um, books on other subjects related to uh, martial arts in culture and society. I have a co-founder with Ben Judkins of the journal Martial Arts Studies which is published open access, which is free online by Cardiff University Press. Um, we, I have helped organise and often single-handedly organised um, conferences on martial arts studies, sometimes at Cardiff University, sometimes at other universities around the world for the last five or six years. Um, and today I want to talk to you about the issues around the translation and dissemination of uh, Chinese martial arts is the interest of the conference, but I'll talk about that in the context of the reception and construction of martial arts, or as I like to call it, the invention of martial arts, in the Anglophone, British, kind of North American context. There will be issues related to cultural translation. There will be issues related to the transmission and reception of, of martial arts, Chinese martial arts, Wushu, Kung Fu, also Japanese martial arts and other Asian martial arts. Um, but I like to think of it all in terms of a process of, of what I call invention. So I have a book coming out from Oxford University Press in December 2020, uh, which it will be within a month of this conference, which is to be held on the last day of November. Um, and it's called The Invention of Martial Arts, popular culture between Asia and America. And what I will talk to you about today is connected to my research for that um, project and also some offshoots. I'll talk about some different issues around the context of reception, the context of the invention or imagination of Chinese and Asian martial arts um, in the United Kingdom and Anglophone popular culture generally. I want to give um, something of a, a brief kind of history in very broad brushstrokes before I go into some of the, the theoretical and possibly even political issues around martial arts. And I want to begin around 1900. My argument is essentially this. It's that until the early 1970s, there was no concept of martial arts in Western popular culture. Some people will dis disagree with me, they will dispute this. My argument is slightly more sophisticated than saying nothing happened before Bruce Lee. My argument is that the notion of martial arts is a relatively recent addition that has enabled, to, uh, enabled both scholars and practitioners and popular culture generally to have a sense of, a, of what I will call a discursive entity. Okay, um, I'll explain a little bit more about that, but I want to begin with a history around, around 1900. I've, I've grouped the history into certain periods. I've grouped it into 1900 to 1914. That's very, very approximate. 1914, however, is the start of the First World War. Then I want to talk a little bit about what happened in 1914 to 1918, which is the period of the First World War. And then we'll jump to 1939 to 1960, which is the period of the Second World War through to the expansion of media culture. Then the 1960s to 1970. I want to then look at 1917 to 1980. 1980 to 1993. 93 is an enormous year for the dissemination, invention, construction of martial arts in the West. 93 to 2000. 2000 to 2011, 2012 to 2018. These are the very broad categories that I want to organise this conversation into. So 1900 to 1914 in Europe, in Britain, 
is a very um, significant period of transformation. We move from the Victorian era into the Edwardian era. Now, Britain at this time really only knows about Japanese jiu-jitsu. There's not a lot known about Chinese martial arts. The British press was hearing about things like the Boxer Rebellion and different kinds of uprising and different things that kind of worried the, the British psyche, the British mind, the, the British mind that is ideological, imperial and often colonial of course. And it's around this time that in relation to China you start to get the invention of the notion of the Yellow Peril. The character of uh, Fu Manchu is it devised by the British author Sax Roma. Fu Manchu is the kind of ultimate um, evil genius fighting the British Empire. But in terms of martial arts, really Britain only knows the Japanese tradition around jiu-jitsu. We, we have uh, European fighting styles such as stick fighting, Lacan, and the, the French style of La Savate, kind of British boxing as well, of course. And the first jitsu that we have in Britain is called Bartitsu, and this is a style of fighting devised by Edward Barton Wright, who spent time in Japan and learnt some jiu-jitsu and judo styles. Um, and brought them back and combined them with different fighting styles and opened clubs in London. And this was the first jitsu. And Barton Wright became famous because really it's his legacy and his Japanese instructors that he employed who taught people like uh, William and Edith Garrod. And, Ed and Edith Garrod was famous as being part of the bodyguard of the suffragette movement and, and the, the, the suffragette um, leader, Emmeline Pankhurst. So it's it's very interesting period in history. The style is very kind of elegant. It's very dignified. It's very class organized. So the the martial arts, uh, not really martial arts, the jujitsu, the bartitsu, the self defense of this era was organized for the gentleman. It was very class organized, class conscious, and the, it's an interesting thing that. If you look at the, the visual representation of Bartitsu and Jiu-Jitsu and Lacan and Savat from this time, it's very, very dignified. The practitioner would be a middle-class gentleman who um, should not lower themselves to the base form of the, 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 either the colonial subject or the, or the hooligan, the Irish criminal or someone from the underclass. So actually, if you, you could change some of the costumes of the of the styles of botitsu and jujitsu of the 900s and if you put them into chinese costumes it would look very much like a kind of uh, very elegant wushu style of things a lot of the, the 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 stick fighting is not like it's not fighting like bang 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 it's not brutal it would be very big if i had a stick i have a stick somewhere else but if it would be very big um postures very grand and it's about class and dignity 1940 that uh, 1914 comes along and the First World War changes uh, everything, really. This is the death of the gentleman. This is the death of certain ideas of, of class superiority in many ways. And a new forms of brutality are lived and experienced. The weapons of trench clearance are like medieval weapons after the, after the bombs and the gas have gone into the trenches of Europe in the First World War, soldiers would charge in, they'd have to clear, which involved brutal, brutally um, dispatching the opponent. So this is really the death of the, of the, the high era of the, of the gentleman, of Bartitsu, of Sherlock Holmes, this kind of thing. The period 1939 the period between, in, in, after the First World War reconstruction and we get to around 1939 through to 1960, we start to see the emergence of two different key strands. I argue that they're key strands. On the one hand, you see the development of comic books and comic book superheroes, Batman, the Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, Catwoman, Dr. Midnight, and so on. At the same time as we see um, people who have been involved in the military and involved in, in British colonial exploits around the world, systematising self-defence. So you have characters uh, like Fairburn and Sykes 
who they write books called Scientific Self-Defense in the 1930s, All In Fighting in 1942, Shooting to Live, Self-Defense for Women and Girls in the 1940s, Hands Off, Self-Defense for Women. And they talk about gutter fighting. So it's a, a kind of, you see, you find a kind of hybrid in these people, all of whom have spent time in um, either Japan or Shanghai now. We are seeing these, these British colonials in Shanghai learning Chinese and Japanese fighting styles and then wanting to teach them to troops. So they simplify, they talk about brutality, there's no more gentlemen here. So on the one hand, you have this the kind of start of self-defense martial arts training specifically for troops, but also the concept of self-defense, which I think the concept of self-defense in the British context is a lot older and more subterranean and more enduring than concepts like martial arts. I think that self-defense has a very, very long history in the West. Mar martial art is one iteration of it, one version of it, one manifestation of it. So on the one hand, you have the, immersion, the, the emergence of media spectacle, comic book heroes who were doing stylized fighting at the same time as you're seeing a more subterranean development of, of, of brutal and effective combat styles. And it's in the 1960s that these two things come together. So between 1961 and 1969, the British uh, media industry produced a television show called The Avengers. This is not The Avengers of, of, of the comic books. This is The Avengers that's more like James Bond, kind of Sherlock Holmes. It's British gentlemen and women, and they're kind of in the swinging 60s, so they're kind of cool, but they still have the, the semiotics of the classic gentleman. And, um, but the, the, the female character is kind of new proto-feminist, um, sexy, but but really competent and really good fighter. And the kind of fighting styles that these people use, they're not really fighting styles at, at first. They just invented the choreography is bizarre. It's meant to look exotic. It's meant to look secret. So secret service, secret spies, new styles. There's no acknowledgement of any kind of a, an East Asian origin to them. But by the mid 60s, um, we are starting to see the incorporation of some Chinese martial arts in the fight choreography of the Avengers. Um, it was in this television series in the mid 60s that the Guinness Book of World Records has acknowledged that the first depiction of Chinese martial arts by a female uh, white actress was carried out and there's a world record for that. We start to see the emergence of, of exotic looking fighting styles being incorporated into a lot more film and television choreography. Elvis Presley is making films in the 60s showing his Japanese martial arts. The Green Hornet between 1966 and 1977 67 is starring Bruce Lee as Kato and this is the first time the world, the Western world, has seen anything like his his Kung Fu style, which is, is based in Wing Chun or Yong Chun, but Bruce Lee makes it more spectacular for the screen. Big kicks, he incorporates Taekwondo techniques, he incorporates lots of flashy looking things that he just makes up on the spot. Um, so in the Western world, karate, Japanese karate, Japanese martial arts are much more well known than Chinese martial arts. Bruce Lee, in his texts, in the magazine interviews and in things that he writes, defines Kung Fu, or Gong Fu as he likes to call it, because he uses the Cantonese. Um, he calls it and explains it to the audience as Chinese Karate, okay? Chinese Karate. So you see the dominance in the, in the Western mind of the Japanese martial arts, that's what was known most. If you have to explain something in terms of another thing, it means that that other thing is much more well known. So karate, jiu-jitsu, judo were um, enormous in, in Western context and growing in international media context all the time. Between 1970 and 1980, this is when we start to see Kung Fu, this is when Chinese martial arts become much more prominent and, I mean, Bruce Lee films, we cannot overstate the impact of Bruce Lee films between 1971 
1973. There were also films such as Billy Jack in 1971 that were championing Hapkido and Korean martial arts. Um, but really the term that takes over now is Kung Fu and they called it the Kung Fu craze of 1973, an international craze inspired by David Carradine's starring role in the kind of American Western drifter TV series called Kung Fu. Uh, there's not much Kung Fu in it, <laughs> not much Kung Fu at all, but nonetheless it puts the idea into the Western imaginary and through the 70s we start to see films like the first Star Wars film in 1977 which have a kind of Shaolin kind of chic to it. The, 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 there's the, the Force is kind of chi, the Jedi Knights are kind of Shaolin monks. You see these ideas percolating in. The film The 36th Chamber of Shaolin is huge in 1978. It's a subcultural classic and it inspires so many things. There's a lot going on in the 1970s to 1980. And the, the dominant image of that time is Kung Fu, it's Bruce Lee inspired, it's it, Chinese martial arts are the ultimate fantasy object of martial arts. Between 1980 and 1993 what you see in the Western media environment is the invention of ninjas. So the film industry of Hollywood gets the realization or achieves the realization, the kind of Satori awakening that Ninjas are cheap. You know, you can have the same five actors running into the room to be killed by the hero because they're all wearing ninja suits. They can just keep coming around and recycling them. No ninja film ever made a loss. It really begins... I mean, that there were ninjas in James Bond films of the 60s, but it really begins with Chuck Norris's film The Octagon in 1980. And ninjas capture the imagination. The same time as that, Shaolin monks continue to captivate... Um, the imagination thanks to films like Shaolin Temple of 1982. Um, so the, this era, 1980 to the early 90s, is dominated by ninjas. Ninjutsu is a popular practice. You see the film Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 1987. American Ninja, so many offshoots of that through the 80s, 1985. Um, and these are big. I mean, these are really big. Obviously, uh, Steven Seagal films emerge as well during the 80s and John claude Van Damme films, which are, which are inspired more by Aikido and so on. But ninjas in the 80s, ninjas and Shaolin monks. Now, in the Western invention of martial arts, the two biggest years, 1973, because that is the year of Enter the Dragon, which starred Bruce Lee, um, and 1993, because that is the year that sees not one, not two, but three massive events. We see the first UFC, the, the uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship in 1993. Okay, the first one that's shown on, on cable channels and it, then it becomes available on VHS video. You also see the release of the Wu-Tang Clan album Enter the Wu-Tang which is massively inspired by the 36 Chambers of Shaolin and, and, and these, these, these martial arts films of the 80s and um, we also see third the uh, emergence of the Power Rangers so you have what you have here is the emergence of martial arts in sport it really captures the imagination eventually Wu-Tang Clan, this is the height of rap and hip-hop's popularity in the Western world. The Wu-Tang Clan, that album was, the, it defined the pinnacle of popularity. And the Power Rangers, they, I mean, they define children's interests. Um, I mean, that's children's media, saturation there. So that's three huge realms, all emerging in 1993. Um, and then... So we go through to 2000 and these, this, is, this is the era we start to see after 2000, we see Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, we see the film The Matrix, we see Kill Bills Volume 1 and Volume 2, we see this, uh, the massive kind of transnational development of martial arts aesthetics, Kung Fu Panda 
2008. Martial arts are everywhere. They are part of the mainstream of, uh, the, of Western culture and the Western consciousness. Um, and they're just, they are just absolutely mainstream. And then in 2000, between 2012 and 2018, what we see is the mainstreaming, the consolidation and the establishment of martial arts as normal, as a normal part of life uh, in all aspects. So we see Ronda Rousey winning the, the UFC um, in 2012. Jay Jones wins Olympic gold in, gold in Taekwondo. Nicola Adams wins gold in boxing in, in the Olympics in 2012. Conor McGregor, who is Irish, but British people don't know the difference between Britain and Ireland, so they think that Conor McGregor is, is British winning the UFC and mainstreaming Ultimate Fighting Championship from 2015 and so on. We even start to see, thanks to Netflix, we start to see many more um, uh, Asian, Hong Kong, Chinese um, Kung Fu films. We see a lot more uh, Wong Kar Wai, we see the Ip Man films, we see the Grandmaster and so on. Now, all of this has produced what I would call a, a discursive constellation, a different constellation of types of martial artsiness, different images and sets of imagery of martial arts. And in, in audiovisual popular culture, they've been there in film and television um, and literature and magazines in lots of different ways. The mainstream British press, however, if we look at it historically, it registers martial arts in some very peculiar ways. Um, the British press has been slow to pick up on it. It, it. The British press continues in many respects, many much of the press, to regard martial arts as somehow foreign. So um, uh, martial arts have always been regarded as different kinds of craze, whether that be kind of um, uh, boxer size, kickboxer size crazes. Chinese martial arts are underrepresented, except Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan, is very popular in the British press and has been for quite some time. Tai Chi is always regarded as good, it's always a positive story. It's lumped in with a with a general mishmash of what we would now call kind of new age mindfulness um, project, body improvement project, life improvement project. It's often lumped in with things like yoga. Um, they're often you'll often see an article about Tai Chi. That and the pictures show in next to the article it'll be yoga poses. So there's a bit of a confusion around Tai Chi, but Tai Chi is universally regarded in the Western media, especially the press, as always, always a good thing. It's a good thing for women, it's a good thing for older people. Meanwhile, MMA is mainstream, the UFC is mainstream. So we see what I like to call a discursive constellation of different strands, different themes. You have the kind of ninja Shaolin tending to Jedi, spiritual, mystical kind of thing, which is ultra mystical, but then it shades into to kid stuff and people regard it as potentially quite childish. There's been a long connection between uh, Asian martial arts, especially Japanese martial arts perhaps, and black culture. So you've got this kind of cool black hip hop connection which also shades into the childish. There have long been cartoons that have ridiculed the connection between black popular culture and martial arts. Hong Kong Fui in the 70s, um, Chop Socky Chooks is another thing that has a 1970s nostalgia that is a cartoon that kind of laughs at the, the black popular cultural interest in, in Asian martial arts. But you also have a strand which is the kind of the kind of white gentlemanly or, or competent strong woman, the spy, Jason Bourne, James Bond, Sherlock Holmes, these kinds of characters, the Avengers, um, which come from this kind of Bartitsu sort of um, gentlemanly kind of stock of images. And then you have the kid stuff, the kid stuff, you've got the, the, the ninja stuff, the ninjago, the power rangers and so on. So it's a discursive constellation. And I've often found it quite challenging to work out which way we might think about how to um, define and explore the place of um, Asian martial arts in Western popular culture. But my sense is that the backdrop against which they tend to need to be 
um, understood and appraised is overwhelmingly connected to the long history of Orientalism. Now, some people think that Edward Said's arguments about Orientalism, which we're going to apply not just to the Middle East and the Israel-Palestine situation that, that organised Said's thinking, we can also apply them to the Western thinking about Chinese, Japanese and East Asian culture. Now, Orientalism does not mean racism, but it's not a million miles away. It's a kind of fetishistic, um, reductive simplification of something that's much more complex and unique. And the backdrop against which Asian martial arts have been imported, but actually invented in discourse, has to be understood against a backdrop of Orientalism. Um, I've carried out lots of different types of research into this. Running behind me now are images that are stills from a uh, from adverts, um, which I researched um, to write about the history of the representation of China and Chineseness, Chineseness, in British adverts, and what I discovered in my research through the whole history of of. British adverts that represent Chineseness um, is the structure of Orientalism. It's a straightforward uh, bordering on racist simplification of an entire nation, complex groupings of, of ethnicities and languages into very, very simple formulas. And this is the interpretive context into which Chinese martial arts. Um, are made sense of in the Western context. So certainly we don't have the situation of straightforward racism or, or anti-Chinese racism in the West, but Chinese cultural practices and Chinese cultural um, products such as Kung Fu, Wushu, Tai Chi and so on, Qigong, um, Feng Shui, uh, you name it, is, is, is simplified and fetishized and romanticized and fantasized about in ways that don't necessarily bear any relation to their existence elsewhere. So, what's the situation? The situation is one in which, as I hope to have shown to some extent, there really was no concept of martial arts as such in the English language, Anglophone, British, Western, North American context before the early 1970s. There was the term martial arts as a translation of the Japanese term buge or the unknown Chinese terms such as wushu or gongfu or kung fu. But it's because of the media intervention. It's the media, it's the television series kung fu, it's Bruce Lee films that really invent the concept of martial arts and the martial artist. And in the West, we've never really shaken off that, that Orientalism. It's such a massive, massive impact. I mean, it transformed Western popular culture. Before Bruce Lee, there was no kind of sense of, I want to be a martial artist. Bruce Lee invented that category for people, like children, teenagers, say the world over saying, I want to be a martial artist. That was a new thing, an entirely new thing. Not a not a soldier or police officer, or I want to be a chef, or I want to be a lorry driver or a truck driver. I want to be a martial artist. That is the kind of massive convulsion of the global popular culture imaginary that was produced by Bruce Lee's representations of Chinese martial arts. And it is a gift to the world. It's a gift that I love. So many people know and love, so many people still fantasize about. And I mean fantasize in the sense of imagine, desire, create, perform, play, enjoy, produce identities through. But it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand it's a blessing. Bruce Lee reinvented stereotypes, he transformed the stereotypes of Chinese in the West. But on the other hand it's still a stereotype. So the context in which um, East Asian Chinese martial arts were imported into the West 
is one that was determined and dominated by media representations. And those representations, as with all media representations, are not simple, not straightforward, despite how simplistic we might think the films are, the action films, the kung fu films, wushu films, wuxia films. We might think they're straightforward, simplistic, but they have complex cultural effects. Thank you very much.